My name is Erin Jackson and I'm president of the University of Canterbury Students Association and what we've done this year is try to offer students an opportunity to engage with both the UCSA and with the university itself and ask any questions that you've got in a really open forum. Um, so this is the fourth time we've done, um, done this this year and offered you the opportunity to do so and so we're basically we're going to run a Q&A sort of session. Um, Tom Horrocks who's the finance officer just down here in the check shoot is running around with a microphone to answer your questions as you have it, but basically I'm just going to say a couple of words and then Dr. Cara is going to say a few words and then we'll be open for questions. Um, so you've got a couple of minutes to start thinking or to run away if you're desperately not wanting to be here. Um, but basically from where, where I am at the moment in terms of what the UCSA has been up to, we've obviously had our elections last term and so we look, we're in the process of our um, outgoing executive are working on you know finishing up the projects that they started so some of those are just coming to fruition and also training the new executive that's coming in for next year. In terms of things that we've been seeing happening around the place, we've seen a lot of conversation around things like the law building move and um, the shift in, in, in for the temporary law library location and what that means. And we're working really closely with students across the board to figure out how we can make sure that there's enough study space. Because one of the things that it's highlighted for us is that study space is going to be a big question moving forward. As all the buildings need to be remediated, where we can decant people to and what that means for the students that are here as well. As well as that, we've also had um, a lot of involvement um, recently in terms of the fun things on campus. So, for example, tonight we've got the Supreme Clubs Awards happening. Well, we'll we will recognise the over 120 clubs and the contribution that they bring to campus. Last week we had the Blues Awards where we recognised all of the fantastic sports people that we've got on campus. And the week before that we had Madcaps, which was all the performing arts clubs as well. So there's been a lot going on around here um, and a lot happening, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone's got um, about some of the more of the details. But I'd like to invite the Vice Vice Chancellor of the University, Dr. Rod Carr, to come and say a few words as well. Well, thanks, Aaron. A uh, couple of things. First of all, for those of you who are going to watch this on video, uh, it's important that we know there are many ways in which we can communicate with students. Uh, we can do that standing up and entertaining you in the uh, undercroft. Uh, one of the issues with that is we might interrupt your own conversations and coffee. I'll apologise for that. Secondly, we also provide it online for those of you who want to have a look at bits and pieces of it later and use it as evidence against management in due course, that's fine as well. In addition, there's all the online media and of course there's Canter, which covers matters of interest and we're delighted that uh, Canter seems to be increasing its circulation uh, and is writing some really good stuff about what's going on at the university. Today is mainly about answering your questions. This is the first time we've done this sort of without any pre-formed questions. So I hope that those of you who are here in the Undercroft will take the opportunity to form up some of those questions. Let me start with a couple of questions I'd ask if I was a student, and that might get things going. The first one I would sort of ask is, is it true that you're closing the law school and the law library? Now the answer is we're not closing the law school, actually we're recruiting academic staff to the law school at the moment and I was just reading about our new criminal justice course which is on offer for next year. So lots of new and good things going on. It is the case however that in order to remediate the law school building we are going to have to move the law library out of the building. We have to gut the law school from floor to ceiling, wall to wall and inject the concrete with this nasty resin. We will then put it all back together again. It will take about 14 months to do that. In the process, we are going to move the law library into the central library in James Hutt, where, by the way, it came from. And at the time it was moved, students objected to it being moved. So it's not surprising that some might be concerned about moving of the library. The law library itself, as with the central library, will need to be closed for much of the summer recess while over 300 tradesmen swarm all over this building to get it completely finished for the start of next year. We'll need to make special arrangements for retrieval of books for faculty and postgraduate students who want to work over the summer. Next question I might ask is, um, is it true that the uh, university management uh, doesn't talk and communicate regularly with students? And the answer is we will talk and communicate as regularly with students as students want to put up with hearing from us. There is nothing to hide, there are no secrets. We are in this together. Some may ask, is it true that lots of staff are leaving the university? And the answer to that is no, they're not. Our staff want to stay and engage in working with this great institution. We just had a voluntary redundancy round and it looks like 
12, that's one, two, full-time equivalent staff out of 1,950 may elect and take voluntary redundancy. That's less than half the number who made the same choice a year ago. So, things have been tough, people are tired, students are busy, and spring has come. Happy to take your questions. Thank you. With that, having watched people run away during that, I'm going to ask whether there are actually any questions, or I might ask Rod some as well um, briefly, but are there any questions to start off with? Pete, down the back. In regards to the point you made before about the law library moved, I think um, on, as a law student myself, I'd say that many law students are well aware that the law library has to be moved out in the temporary short term because of work that needs to be done, and no one really is contesting this. But the point you made about the law library originally being in James Height, that was, as far as I'm aware, around about 20 years ago when there were, and correct me if I'm wrong, but approximately six to 8,000 people, and there are considerably more students at the university, I believe in the realm of 14 to 15,000 students at the university now, which means that wouldn't you agree that there needs to be more space provided in terms of putting the law library back into the law commerce precinct once we've remediated the law school? Yeah, look, I think there are a couple of questions in there. One is, what's the size of the university? This university has more square metres of built space than any other New Zealand university, and that includes after the earthquake. So actually, we are very well endowed for space. Our issue is we're going to have a rolling mall for the next 10 years while we move out of every bit of concrete space and remediate it, not because of anybody's fault. It's just a fact that also in the process of doing that, we need to make sure that we use our very, very scarce capital to reduce our site and property costs so we can spend the money on research and teaching. Part of that is to make sure that when we move things around, we have to prioritise when they get moved back and what gets put back where. That simply means some trade-offs. We are not the university we were in 2010. We are the university of the future. It is the case that there are about 600 law students, and it is the case that there are over 3,500 seats in the Central Library. It is the case that the refurbishment of the Central Library will create more student study space than we had in this building before. It is also the case that we are decanting out of this library into the engineering library the science book stacks to create more space in the Central Library. So when it all comes down to it, yes, it is the case that we are going to have to make some trade-offs. The question will be, at what point in the future would it be a priority to move the law collection back to not only a dedicated library space, which it will have in the Central Library, but a dedicated space 400 metres in one direction? That's a question that will be addressed, I'm sure, in the future, but I was honest in saying it is probably the case that that's more like 10 years away than three years away. Hello, Dr. Carr. I, I just walked in, so I've missed out on the previous uh, discussion, but I have a question with regards to engineering. Um, in the search for funds, do you see an opportunity for the engineering uh, to be more closely working uh, with, with industry? Look, I think our engineers, first of all, do work pretty closely. I think of our students who all have a thousand hours of time they need to put in before they can graduate. It's a not for credit, but graduation requirement. Our engineering faculty are increasingly engaged in research projects, either collaborating with or in some cases funded by industry. Uh, we have a couple of really good examples of industry-funded research collaboration and student-engaged initiatives. For example, the Engineering Power Centre, the Electric Power Engineering Centre, EPIC, it's been around for a while, has something like 16 corporate funders of largely student scholarships and research, a good example. Uh, NZI3, not exclusively engineering, but now over 60 masters and PhD and postgraduate students working with over 20 business partners in NZI3, another great example. And looking to the future, the proposition for the UC Quake Center involves in excess of 32 industry partners providing funding and guidance for research and teaching around earthquakes and responsiveness and preparedness. So I think we will see more engagement, but I think we already see quite a lot. Thank you, Dr. Carr. 
Um, I've got a question, Dr. Carr, just uh, touching on um, one of the things, the points you brought up during your answer. One, a thing that students might have heard a lot about recently, um, and one of the pieces of work that's been going on around the university has been that of the UC Futures Project. Um, and so students were aware, obviously, that it was being presented um, to government last week, and we're aware that also a lot of the issues that we're talking about at the moment are driven in due to, you know, cash shortages. And so I think that it'd be really useful to say, you know, how did that presentation go and what was the reaction like? So the, how did the presentation go? Well, we've presented it and, uh, and it was received. Um, what does that mean? Well, we have to be a bit careful. We need to give the government time to reflect on what we've asked them for and told them about us. The UC Futures Project actually, while it is an ask for capital, focuses on the future graduate profile of those who become alumni of the University of Canterbury. We focus in that case for support not just about our need for capital for buildings, but mainly we focus on what will a graduate from the University of Canterbury be able to claim in addition to mastering their discipline of study, in addition to being an engineer, a scientist, a lawyer, a teacher, a social worker. What else will they have had the opportunity to do? We talk about the four major experiences. We want the vast majority of our students to have access to a work integrated learning experience as part of their program of study to improve their employability and their awareness of the ability to start their own businesses before they graduate. We want a large proportion of all our students to have the opportunity to study abroad for credit as part of their program of study. That requires us to think more carefully about how we would integrate some of our programs with course offerings in some of the world's top 100 universities where we already have exchange agreements. We want all our graduates to have the opportunity to develop a cultural confidence and competence to operate in a bicultural New Zealand and a multicultural society. And the fourth degree we want all of our students to have access to community engagement opportunities. Does that mean that we want you all to go work somewhere for free? No. It just means that we accept that many of our graduates will be community leaders of the future for not-for-profit organisations as well as for business and government. Community engagement is an integral part of developing a portfolio of skills and capabilities that will last a lifetime. Our case for support, our UC of the future, builds on things we already do, but it makes more explicit that these would be things and opportunities all students at the university should have access to. Oh, thank you. Tom? Does anyone else have any other questions? No? All right. In that case, as always, thank you very much for being here. And th there's no other questions? No? Lovely. Um, thank you very much for being here today and thank you for participating in the open forum. We're obviously also, as um, Dr Carr said at the beginning, we're always happy to take feedback and communication from in anyone at any time, um, but this is just provides another opportunity for that to happen. Thanks very much for your time today and thank you Dr Carr for being here this morning. Thank you for the opportunity.